Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining uh, this session. Uh, we're gonna get started right now. In this presentation, I'm gonna be talking about um, our experience as uh, Try for Amsterdam with uh, with building Exxon based uh, our applications for uh, the last couple of years, uh, which I've dubbed distilling the decade because it's been around 10 years now uh, that CQRS has, uh, has been a thing. So my name is Joost Kuipers. I work as a CTO and hands-on architect at Try for Amsterdam. Uh, I do some other things like uh, doing spring trainings delivery uh, every now and then. And uh, you can see a picture here of me uh, actually doing an, uh, an in-person conference last year uh, at the B Amsterdam building at the Exonic event. Uh, it's a new experience for me doing it like this, uh, but I, uh, I hope we all get to enjoy it. Um, Trifork Amsterdam, where I work, is um, a company that uh, creates uh, custom enterprise solutions using open source software. And um, it's actually the birthplace of the uh, of the Axon framework, if you weren't aware. Um, Albert Buysen, who is currently CTO for Axonic, um, used to work for um, Trifork Amsterdam, and, and that's where he started to do the development of the framework that eventually led to the to the Axon framework, as we now all know. Um, and because of that, uh, we have a long history in, in applying Axon to a number of different projects, both in really old versions, as well as very recent versions that integrate with things like Axon Server. Um, so based on the experience that we've had over the years with those things, uh, I created this presentation for you. This is the view of our current office, right? We're in Corona, so a lot of people are still working from home. Uh, I'm recording this uh, from home as well. Uh, although uh, my uh, my office is not actually uh, pictured here, uh, I typically sit behind uh, the the bed of my uh, youngest son because I uh, I have quite a full house. But um, first thing I want to talk about is should you even be using event sourcing or not if you are building an Exxon based application? Because Exxon does actually support uh, using CQRS without event sourcing, um, and this is not necessarily something that everyone knows or or even thinks about. What it means if you do that is that only the current state of your aggregates will be stored. Uh, this could be uh, just in a relational database uh, tables, for example, and then mapped using JPA. And whenever you have a command, uh, the um, uh, instead of doing event sourcing, the aggregate will just be loaded by querying that current state. And um, what I found is that typically when people start with Axon to build an application, they will just use event sourcing without even thinking about this option. And uh, honestly, uh, this is very often true for us as well, although we do think about it, but then we, we choose event sourcing. Um, but we've used this setup uh, of doing Axon without event sourcing for an application that was already there. And then we wanted to introduce Axon after the fact. And we found that for migrating uh, an application to a CQRS based application, it can make a lot of sense to actually use this model. Because in our case, this application was already doing some event publishing uh, using some mechanisms, but um, it, it never really felt like events were a first class citizen, whereas obviously uh, in Exxon uh, they are. Also, uh, we've had some issues where uh, incoming requests that needed to be applied onto an entity or an aggregate, if you will, um, would run into issues where they were applied concurrently and we couldn't really handle that properly. Whereas Exxon actually makes it quite easy to enforce that commands are handled in a serialized manner when you apply them to the same aggregate instance. So that's nice. Um, on the other hand, we found that if we wanted to introduce Axon, it wasn't really easy to start introducing event sourcing because we already had an existing model. And not only did we already have that, uh, we also didn't have events that we could use to say, well, this is the history uh, of this state. So we said, well, let's just give it a go and see if we already have this existing model, if we can just use that as the basis for um, our aggregate state. So. That was the main reason that we did this. Uh, but in general, uh, there are of course some benefits in not having to do event sourcing because event sourcing comes with its own set of problems. So that means if you don't have to store events and then support them forever, you don't need to worry about things like, oh, but what am I gonna do if my events change? Do I need to write upcasters or do I need to rewrite events in retrospect, that sort of thing. Uh, um, but also technical issues like, okay, if we update to a newer version of Axon and the internal representation of how we store events in uh, in a database changes, how do we need to uh, build migration tools for that? Because, well, if you don't actually store events, you don't need to worry about how they're stored either, as it turns out. 
Um, also, of course, if you're just storing uh, current state for your aggregates, uh, you'd never have to worry about the problem where you are introducing more and more and more events for a particular aggregate instance, uh, and it just takes longer and longer to event source because you're just going to be storing the same amount of states typically if you're just storing current state. So that also means that things like snapshotting, snapshot management is no longer a concern. Now, obviously, um, there is a reason that most people are not doing this and are choosing for event sourcing because there are a lot of benefits in doing that. One of them is that you can choose now when you're building uh, an aggregate to say, well, a lot of events are not necessarily that interesting to the aggregate itself. It doesn't need to handle them to uh, build up some internal states. They're just going to be handled by event handlers to update some query models. Um, and then later on, if it turns out that the aggregate does actually need some of that event state for some new use case, well, you can just add it after the fact. You cannot do that anymore if you're just storing current state. So then the rule where you typically say, when in doubt, leave it out, when it comes to adding things to your aggregate state, becomes more of a, well, you know, let's just add it just to be safe because we might need this in the future. Um, and that means that your aggregates can become more bloated than they, than they need to be. Also, um, if you, especially when you migrate an existing application onto this, you probably have some normalized model already uh, for storing your aggregate state because you were also using it as a query model. That means on the one hand that it's not necessarily very efficient for just loading everything up to come up with your aggregate state when applying a command. But on the other hand, you might also be tempted to continue to use it as a query model even after migrating. Um, and that sort of breaks the whole idea of having separate models for um, applying your commands to and then querying, right? That's what we want to uh, achieve typically with CQRS. So what we found is that um, having uh, no event sourcing in your application definitely helps in getting your application migrated over to use Axon after the fact. It's way easier to do this if you can start to reuse the, the data and the model that you have already, rather than having to reinvent a, a whole events uh, sourcing mechanism uh, after the fact as well. But uh, we, I wouldn't typically recommend it as an approach to use for the longer term. Um, if you do have a use case where you think it actually makes sense to do that, I would at least recommend you to use uh, an aggregate uh, state representation where you just serialize the whole aggregate onto uh, a single representation, some blob, with the XML or JSON or binary format and store that rather than using a relational model where you separate the state out because it will be both much more efficient, but it will also enforce a more strict CQRS based representation where uh, you're gonna have separate query states and, and not reuse the same model for both uh, aggregates and query. Um, if you want to then later on introduce event sourcing as well, um, a, a likely uh, mechanism for that would be to introduce some migration events that contains uh, all of the aggregate states. So you can just initialize it from that and then take it from there. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about is that once you have events, obviously it makes sense to start using those events for more than just events so sourcing and to start sharing your events because, well, sharing is caring. However, um, there might be some issues with this. So if you look at uh, one of the benefits that is very often touted also by Axon itself, and this is a picture taken from the reference documentation, it is that uh, having events as, uh, as a cornerstone of your application allows for location transparency, right? I can broadcast an event. I don't have to know where it's being handled. It could be within the same application. It could be transported over a message bus or via some event store and then handled by an external application. So if I structure my application well, I can start off with a well-structured monolith and then slowly break it up into individual pieces that are deployed by themselves. Now, uh, whenever you do that, you always have to be aware of um, the, um, the danger of creating a distributed monolith where even though you've split things up, everything is still tightly coupled. So whenever you want to do a deploy, you have to deploy things together in lockstep um, and you have a, a set of tightly coupled services, basically. Now, when we say coupling and loosely coupled, it, it helps to explain what, what coupling actually is. And in the previous slide, we were talking about location-based coupling. So that means coupling in space, right? We have one thing needs to know where another thing is in order to be able to, be able to integrate with it. And events are a very nice way to get decoupling in space, right? It's just something that is there and it can be published in multiple ways and we don't really need to know. So that benefit is real. 
The same thing holds true for coupling in time. Coupling in time means something else needs to be available in order for me to interact with it. Right? If I want to query something, it typically needs to be there. However, if I just want to broadcast an event to something and I do that over something like uh, a message uh, bus or I publish it in an event store and someone else can listen to that event store, I don't have to wait until something else is, is available and is done processing my events for me to publish it. So I'm decoupled in time as well. That's nice. However, there is a third form of coupling, and that is when you share contracts. Because whenever we exchange information, that information will have uh, data corresponding to a certain schema. Um, that schema uh, is also going to be, um, uh, uh, or actually the, the propagation is going to be performed based on some protocol. So you're coupled to that maybe. Um, but even within the schema, there are things like, okay, what fields are required? What fields are optional? What types can I actually express? Right? Uh, what do they mean? Uh, what changes can I expect? What boundaries do I have of certain values? All of those things uh, apply to uh, what is essentially a contract that ties things together. Now, when you have existing events that you use for event sourcing, you just start to distribute them. Um, Basically, you are introducing a shared contract, but very often without deliberately doing that. So basically what you're going to end up with is a Java jar file that has a bunch of event types and you're going to have a serialization, deserialization mechanism and you say, this is how I share my events. Um, and that's very implicit. And that can cause all sorts of problems when um, uh, listeners uh, get out of sync with that or if they're not Java based, for example. In addition to that, very often, events used for event sourcing are very fine-grained. They contain a lot of information also about the why and not just the what of data changes that happen, which is actually uh, one of the nice things about having them. But that means that when you expect external uh, systems to process the same sort of events, that those systems will need a lot of knowledge about the internals of your application in order to be able to make sense out of those events. And that creates a form of coupling as well, obviously. So some tips on avoiding this sort of coupling is, first of all, make sure that when you design your events that you make them as flat as possible, right? They should just be basically key value pairs, just fields with names and values. Don't fall into the trap of creating a lot of structure types within events and then uh, doing things like introducing polymorphism on them or reusing those um, inner types across different event types. Because very often what you will find is that creates a very big mess where you don't actually notice that you are changing things on one part but it's also affecting the compatibility of another part in your application. Um, so uh, if, you only, um, if you only follow one of these tips, it would be this. Make sure that events, and same typically holds true for commands, that they are simple, uh, simple podios, basically. On the consumer side, also make sure that when you are handling events, that you don't just say, well, I'm going to assume that I will be able to perfectly deserialize everything that, that will be sent to me because I have full knowledge of all of the types of events that exist. So make sure that you only handle types that you're actually interested in. If you get a different type of events, you don't even need to deserialize it. You can just say, I'm not interested in this, so I'm just gonna forego doing that. I'm not gonna throw an exception. And the same is true for fields within an events, right? If you have a certain small set of fields that you know that this is interesting for me in order to be able to process events successfully, don't worry about any of the other fields that are there and if they change or if there are new additions in there. Um, this becomes especially easy if you start using events as triggers uh, because then very often you just care about the type of event and you care about the aggregate identifier and that gives you enough information to start broadcasting information like, oh, something has happened in the application, maybe you want to come and fetch some new information. If you're interested in that, I did a lot of talk in the uh, last year's presentation about dealing with events um, uh, as they uh, move through the life cycle of your application. Now, on a more advanced level, you might also be able to tag certain events to be either private or public. So then whenever you are developing and you see that, oh, this is a private event, you know I can safely refactor this, I can change this because I'm fully in control of everything that needs to be able to process those events. On the other hand, if it's public, um, this is no longer true and then I need to be a bit more careful in making sure that my changes that I make are backwards compatible there. Um, taking that to the next level leads to something where you say, well, basically, I, I probably shouldn't be able to publish my 
event sourcing events directly as is, I should be able to aggregate them into higher level milestone events and publish them. Um, now, that's nice because it allows for coarser grained events that are easier to process, but you can also add additional state that may not necessarily be derived directly from the uh, event sourcing events, but that makes it easier for event listeners to uh, to handle the, uh, the incoming events because there's more information about the related aggregate in there, for example. But of course, this is real work, right? This is not something that is just built in as a given. Um, so you, this is not something that you necessarily need to do in order to get some better loose coupling than just blindly publishing things, right? So uh, start with the tips that I gave you uh, before this one and, and think about milestones later on if you feel a need for it. I do think that milestone events might actually be the answer to, yeah, but how, how does Kafka actually fit into using Exxon and things like event sourcing? Uh, Kafka is not a great fit for event sourcing necessarily, but it is definitely a great fit for just publishing these sorts of milestone events where you have lots of different consumers that will be interested in, in handling them. Um, when it comes to modeling your aggregates, of course, you need to think about what do I actually group within a single aggregate root or below a single aggregate root and where do I actually have boundaries between those things. And that breaking up of your domain model can actually be quite tricky to do. Um, Typically, uh, this is done using uh, domain-driven design concepts, right? Uh, making sure that you have a, um, uh, a bounded context, basically, where everything within needs to be consistent and that consistency will be managed by the aggregate route. Um, and there will be little interaction between different aggregate routes. And if you need them, it will probably be managed by, uh, by a saga there. Now, as an example of an aggregate route of an application that I work with, uh, we had a medical record. And in the medical record, we had all the information that you would expect there typically. So things like administrative data, names of people, uh, basic medical data like allergies, uh, reports. Every day, doctors and nurses would write a short report after visiting a patient, uh, medicine prescriptions, that sort of thing. And uh, this is like a very natural aggregate route where you say I have a medical record and I have some information below that. However, uh, what we quickly found there is that not all of the aggregates that make up the medical record aggregate route are created equal. So things like administrative data, basic medical data, they are fairly stable, right? You populate them once, they may change every now and then, uh, but you're not going to have uh, an, a lot of commands on a daily basis for the, that type of data, which means also the amount of events that you actually store for them remains fairly stable. Things are different already, for example, for things like reports, because nurses typically get to actually tend to uh, do a report three times a day. Even if there are there, there's nothing worth reporting, they will actively report that there was nothing worth reporting. So these reports are ever growing basically at a steady pace, but still for us, it was very manageable pace, uh, just a couple of events per day. Then we implemented some new functionality where we had to administer medical actions so that we could uh, report the time spent on those and the type of actions to an insurance company to get reimbursed. And it, it felt like a natural thing to just add to the medical record aggregate because it belongs to the medical record. It's, it's actions performed by uh, someone uh, like a doctor or a physiotherapist working with the patient. So that's how we set things off. However, what we found after a while was that uh, actually for this particular use case, we had quite a lot of actions because these things were very fine grained. Uh, doctors have to report even some things on a five minute basis. So you get a lot of different actions reported on a daily basis for an aggregate. Um, and that becomes a drag on your event sourcing, right? When you have to load a medical record now, we have to event source if, if there is no snapshot. Yeah, we have to event source all of those um, uh, insurance actions basically that are there. Um, and this is especially a problem if you are actively uh, developing that functionality. So every now and then you need to just change or discard some snapshots because the aggregate state changed for the insurance related data. But that means you have to throw away the entire snapshot for the entire medical records. And that can be a problem when you want to uh, create new snapshots on the fly. Also, we found that these things were more separate than we thought originally. So only specific event listeners were interested, uh, but also business logic was very confined basically. So after that, what we did was we came up with a different solution uh, where we said, well, instead of just making this part of the medical record aggregate itself, we're going to create like a sibling aggregate route. And it, it will be a one-to-one -one relationship where um, every insurance actions aggregate route 
belongs to exactly one medical record. Not every medical record might necessarily have an insurance action medical route, so it's an optional one-to-one. -one. Um, and then um, everyone, every time that we wanted to publish a command, we would just publish it to this new aggregate route that would just be involved with tracking the insurance actions and, and doing the logic on that. Um, freeing up, so to speak, a lot of resources on the original medical record aggregate routes uh, because it, it wasn't aggregating all of these, uh, these events all of a sudden anymore. Uh, which was a big benefit to us. Um, and it also meant that, that logic could actually be split up because we found sort of after the fact that we could actually do this. This was not necessarily clear from the beginning. Um, it, it does mean a couple of things. We thought, uh, even after making the change, that it, we did this for technical reasons mostly. We still felt that from a modeling, logical point of view, these things would actually belong to the medical record. But now clients publishing these commands have to be aware of this split as well. They have to know that they have to look up an aggregate ID of the sibling aggregate, basically, and then send a command to that. You could have handled this somewhere between the clients and the uh, the aggregates by having some some custom logic in your command handler, but that would be tricky, so we didn't actually do that. Uh, but And you have to make sure, of course, that the life cycle sync up. So at the right time, um, a, a new insurance action aggregate needs to be created for a particular medical record. And whenever the medical record ends, that should also end the corresponding um, uh, insurance action aggregate route. However, we found that that's not really a problem. It's just work you have to do. You have to do keep it in mind and you have to actually do it, but it's not very complex. So introducing sibling aggregate groups is definitely something that I would consider for technical reasons when you expect many events to become part of some new use case that you need to implement where you have the idea that you can actually handle these commands and events uh, relatively isolated uh, compared to the data that's already tracked in the existing aggregate. Um, and this is like a mix of doing it for technical reasons, but also doing proper DDD design. And when I explain things after the fact, you may actually think, well, the way that you explain it now, it, it, it just sounds like its own aggregate. It, it, should, it is a, a natural boundary. So why didn't you do this from the start? Um, but we only came to this insight way later, and it, it could have been quite different, actually. So to us, it felt like we were really doing this for technical reasons, um, and therefore a bit weird at first. But we really like the end result because uh, it allowed for, for individual development and, and different, uh, let's say, growth of, uh, of, uh, of a number of events for these two different, uh, these two, two different aggregate routes while still keeping them together. So that's definitely something worth considering when you're modeling an application. And this is, of course, just one part, one aspect of being able to do scaling, right? What happens when your application grows in terms of the number of, 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 of the, the amount of data that you need to store or the amount of load that you need to be able to process? Now, what we found is that typically for handling load on event handlers and queries, this is no different from how you would handle that in other applications and how you would do scaling. But obviously, for commands, things are a little bit different because commands need to be handled by uh, for a command for a particular aggregate instance can only be handled at one at a time by a command handler for exactly that aggregate. So you cannot just naively do horizontal scaling and start load balancing your commands because what will happen is you will run into all sorts of optimistic locking problems where you will be able to where you try to change the state of one aggregate on two different nodes. One will actually succeed in doing this and the other one will see, hey, something actually changed already and added new events while I was doing the same thing. So now I have to throw an exception and start over. Um, this is where Axon introduced the notion of a distributed command bus for. So the idea there is that uh, whenever you send a command, it will be intercepted by this command bus and that will actually say, okay, based on how I know that your current um, uh, nodes layout and network topology is, um, I'm going to say that uh, aggregate, uh, commands for a particular aggregate ID and a, a particular aggregate type uh, should always be handled by machine B, for example, in this picture. So if I send something on the machine A, but it's actually intended for an aggregate that logically lives on machine B, it will be routed to that machine. And this topology will change as new nodes become available or go away. And this prevents that problem where you end up getting all of these optimistic locking exceptions. And it also makes it much more efficient to start introducing aggregate caching uh, as part of your application. So that's actually quite nice. However, uh, when we tried to use this, this was in the Axon 2 days. And uh, the only supported implementation for this was based on J groups. 
which is a library that we found extremely hard to properly configure. Yeah, I have to be like a network expert on different layers in order to get it right. We couldn't get it right. Um, we actually tried to do a custom implementation of distributed command bus as well. Um, I left the project when that wasn't in place yet. I'm not sure if it ever went to production. Um, after that, Axon did introduce some support also for Spring Cloud-based uh, distributed command bus. But by that time, we were already bitten by so many, uh, let's say, bad experiences with that first implementation that uh, we started to rely basically on, on workarounds. Things like, okay, we can do routing based on aggregate IDs, but we could also choose a different partition key. So if we have a multi-tenant application, we could simply send commands for different tenants to different nodes ourselves. And um, that will automatically lead to uh, commands for the same aggregate instances also being sent to the same nodes. And if you only have a limited number of uh, and fairly stable number of nodes in your application, that, that works perfectly fine as well. Um, then even if a command ever ends up on the wrong server, that's not the end of the world, right? Exxon can automatically just retry the command after doing a new event sourcing, and you can configure the number of retries for that. Um, however, this has all changed when Axon Server was introduced because that actually has a distributed command bus built in, as well as some other nice features. And uh, that makes it uh, a nice example of where it, it really adds some value uh, as custom middleware on top of what like a standard database plus a standard message-oriented middleware uh, server would provide. Uh, however, um, of course, uh, Axon Server being new software, uh, when we started to use it, actually still called Axon DB and Axon Hub. Uh, it does pose a risk as well. So uh, some experiences that we've had with that that were less than optimal were things with uh, gRPC, for example, which is used as the communication mechanism. Um, uh, the version there tends to be a bit behind. So if you want to use gRPC in your own application, you're forced to basically use the same version because you cannot easily use two different versions in one Java application. Um, you have to understand how to tune these things, and that can be a bit tricky. Um, if you want to have a reactive application using things like uh, WebFlux with Spring, um, it's not really built for that yet. So at now it, it mostly works only with uh, like a traditional uh, threats per request blocking uh, mode. Um, but also in operating this, this piece of middleware, Obviously, you have to know how it works. And compared to uh, getting someone who understands MySQL and RabbitMQ, for example, uh, you're going to be a much harder press to find someone that has hands-on experience already with Exxon Server, of course. That's true for any new product in this space. Um, another thing to consider, and this is a different aspect, I think, is if you, um, if you prefer to have um, a dedicated event store, like you get with Exxon Server, that's highly optimized, and can both store and load a huge number of events very efficiently, but provides an opaque way of storing them versus having something like a relational database where it's not optimized for that and it, you will run into certain scalability limits there, but you do get all of the tooling for interacting with the database and processing events, updating them in place, doing custom stuff that might not be that easy uh, if you are uh, using a, a product where the events are just stored in a form where you cannot access them directly anymore. And so that's something to consider. So I do think that um, Axon Server is something, especially because it's already built in in the free for a version, uh, if you just start with the framework nowadays, to consider as something to move into when you go to production. Um, it's, it's made very easy, but that's actually a good point of doing that. But make sure that when, before you do that, you start to think about your requirements, right? How many events do you actually expect your application to hold and to grow with? Um, is that a lot? requiring a custom event store or is it in the numbers where you know that even after a couple of years you're maybe going to have a couple of million events right because that would still just fit in a mysql database table as well uh, do you need any of the additional functionality that's offered uh, and also uh, who's going to be responsible for maintaining and hosting this and i think there it's very interesting to see that um, next to uh, being able to uh, host this yourself either on premise or in the cloud uh, exonic is now starting to offer this as a, as a service um, where you do get the benefits but not the downsides of having to uh, to manage and, and tune and operate this yourself so that's something i think worth investigating in.
So these are some things that we've learned where, well, they work relatively well. We didn't run into terrible mistake. I thought it would be nice for this presentation to also uh, explain some of the things that didn't go so well. Uh, and maybe you learned something from that as well. So I have two use cases here where I've dubbed the first one, the unhealthy health check user, where uh, in our application, whenever a user would log in, that would also be modeled as a command. Uh, basically because we wanted an event to be uh, there for auditing purposes. So you could see if a user logged in, if it was successful, when it was, that sort of thing. Then after a while, we deployed a new version of the app and we changed something in the user aggregate. So we needed to discard the old snapshots and they would just be recreated on the fly whenever a new user would, uh, would log in. Um, which is fine because uh, there weren't that many events typically, right? How often does the user log in? Um, we did this and we tested everything after doing a deploy to make sure that the application was healthy and uh, it seemed fine. Uh, also clients reported that they could just log in and everything worked and the screens looked good. Uh, but we had one issue because we had like one doctor user in our own organization, our own tenants that we would typically use to, uh, to do some tests and to, to, to exercise something in the application. And that one couldn't log in. And what we saw is we would try a login and the browser would just freeze up and would never get a response. And we tried it from multiple servers and multiple machines and nothing happened. So then we started to investigate and we saw a number of low, uh, slow, uh, slow and long running database queries. And after looking at the, the SQL of those queries, we could see that this was actually a query that was trying to load events for a particular user. And uh, we also did a thread dump, and then we saw that we had a lot of threads that were stuck doing event sourcing for some user aggregate. And it turned out that this only happened for our one test user. So every other user in the, in the, in the, in the system did not have this problem. So obviously we then started to investigate what was so special about our test user. And then it turned out that a couple of weeks earlier, um, someone said, well, you know what? We should really have some automated health checks and as part of those, we should also really make sure that users can log in. So just every couple of minutes, let's do a login. And uh, well, conveniently, we already have a test user for that. So let's use that one. So that resulted in tens of thousands of login events for this particular user because of the automated logins that normally weren't that much of a problem because, well, we had snapshotting and the login events weren't even processed by the aggregates to begin with. But now the application was forced to do a full event sourcing because we happened to delete snapshots for users in the, after the deploy. And this was with an old version of Axon even that wasn't smart enough to say, well, I don't need to deserialize certain events if they don't apply to the aggregate. So it was doing way too much work. Um, solution, obviously, in this case, was simply to delete those events, right? We didn't need them for auditing purposes because they were the result of an automated test. And after that, everything worked. Uh, but it does show you very clearly that having unbounded growth, in this case of events, but unbounded queues in general, is a very bad idea in your application. You need to monitor for this. You need to be able to uh, to see this coming. Uh, but it also clear, very clearly shows that once uh, your events grow beyond a certain size, snapshotting is not just a nice performance optimization. It becomes a hard necessity. So that also means that you need to start thinking in certain situations about uh, making sure that when your snapshots become invalid, that you prepare new snapshots for the new version of your application ahead of deployment time, rather than just letting them be created on the fly. Another case I wanted to mention is the, uh, the patient with an identity crisis that we had. And what happened here is we had an external client delivering some administrative data like uh, names and addresses and that sort of thing to our system. And this integration would be based on social security number and would just result in a command to, uh, to an aggregate with the corresponding social security number. Now, it turned out that after a while, when this was running, uh, they introduced a bug in this external client where sometimes they would be sending uh, requests for um, uh, patients without a social security number. Now, what should have happened, of course, is that we would just deny these requests outright saying, hey, this is a required field and uh, we cannot process this. But it actually turned out that we combined this with a bug on our side, where instead of performing proper validation, we were just performing a query to say, okay, give me the aggregate identifier of the first patient that has a social security number of empty. And for sure, we had patients without social security numbers because social security numbers were optional in this particular application. 
So what would happen is whenever these commands would come in, it would always return the same patient. And it turned out that when the bug was introduced, it would return a patient that had been dead for years actually already. This was just a dormant um, medical, a dormant aggregate basically in our application. But now all of a sudden, every day, this aggregate received commands that would change the name of the patient. It would change the gender of the patient even, because typically we would receive the full administrative data in one of these commands. Um, and next to just making changes to that particular patient, it would also be doing additions. For example, it would add new contact persons on a daily basis. And eventually when we found out about this problem, we, uh, we had hundreds or maybe even thousands of contact persons registered for this uh, long gone patient. Then when we wanted to find out, okay, but who is this patient? And we would just look at the queryable state. It meant nothing because this queryable state was actually changing every day, right? So it could be Mr. Anderson this day. It could be Mrs. Doe uh, the next one. Um, so very important lesson learned there. Validate your input. Um, but also um, when you have event sourcing and you run into problems like this, it will actually allow you to go back in time and actually see, okay, so what happened here and, and what should the data have been? So we were actually able to resolve this identity crisis by making sure that we restored the patient to its original name and gender uh, and remove all of the events that should never have been there, right? Also good use case, by the way, for actually deleting events. Um, so in conclusion, um, when you're building applications with, with Axon and you're doing CQRS and event sourcing, there's a lot of choices to be made, right? How do you model things? Um, how do you share information? Um, uh, how do you store these things? And how do you propagate things? And on the one hand, it is important to think about these things up front and to try to get them right. However, it's also important, I think, to realize that you will never be able to get them right all the time for all of these different aspects. So you will you will get some of these wrong. And then it's nice to know what your options are. And uh, one thing I, I like in particular uh, with, uh, with event sourcing is that very often you are able to backtrack on these choices or on mistakes uh, and to fix them. You will learn a lot about this stuff by just applying it and doing it in practice and for real, especially when you have a longer lived application, uh, but obviously uh, a, a much nicer and uh, hopefully less painful way to learn about this stuff is to share with others, uh, which is exactly why we have a conference like this. So I was very glad to be able to uh, to share this with you. And um, with that, uh, we come to the part where um, we do some Q&A and we see if you have some questions. Um, and if not, thanks for attending.